أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل وتدلوا بها إلى الحكام لتأكلوا فريقا من أموال الناس بالإثم لتأكلوا فريقا من أموال الناس بالإثم وأنتم تعلمون يسألونك عن الأهلة قل هي مواقيت للناس والحج وليس البر بأن تأتوا البيوت من بؤورها ولكن البر من اتقى وأتوا البيوت من أبوابها واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون وقاتلوا في سبيل الله الذين يقاتلونكم ولا تعتدوا إن الله لا يحب المعتدين رب الشرح صدري ويسر أمري وحل الوقتة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد من سكان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, inshallah ta'ala, I wanted to uh, first of all thank the administration here for the opportunity to conduct some halaqat here in this masjid. And I wanted to uh, introduce uh, this series. This is actually a part of a series uh, that I'd like to continue here. Uh, it's been going on for some time and it's little by little discussions on the ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. And it's been going on at the Arabi masjid for some time and whatever's been done so far, the recordings are up on our website, on our podcast, inbayina.com. And I wanted to basically continue that series and pick up from where we left off. And the advantage of ayat of Qur'an is you don't have to have the full background to be able to benefit from the ayat of Qur'an, even if you're starting from the middle or, or anywhere else. So today I wanted to uh, actually pick up from ayah number 188 of Surah Al-Baqarah. I will give you a little bit of background though. Surah Al-Baqarah, in, in this particular section that we've already covered, just right before the ayat I'm about to share with you, are the ayat, the famous ayat of fasting. You know, Ya Ayyuhal Ladheena Amanu Kutiba Alaykum Siyam Kama Kutiba Ala Ladheena Kutiba Alaykum Ladheena Kutiba Alaykum Ladheena Those famous ayat that you hear every single Ramadan. And this is actually, these few ayat that are there in Surah Al-Baqarah are the most comprehensive one place in the Qur'an where Ramadan and fasting is discussed. It's covered entirely in one place. You know how there are multiple subjects in the Qur'an? Sometimes a little bit of it is talked about here, a little bit somewhere else, a little bit somewhere else. And the subject is repeated. The subject of fasting in the month of Ramadan is one place, one time, and that's it. And that's the place. It's done. The entire subject is dealt with in that one sermon, one passage. Okay? Now, right after that passage is done, Allah Azza wa Jalla changes the subject almost completely. And the first thing to appreciate is this is Kalamullah. This is the speech of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So even when a subject changes from one to another, it's one khutbah, it's one speech. So there's a connection between what just happened before, the ayat of fasting, and what is about to happen now in this new topic. So let me share some of that with you. Allah Azza wa says, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِنِ Don't consume your monies among each other. He's talking to Muslims and he's telling them, don't eat your monies among each other using cheating, falsehood. Don't scam each other in business. Don't lie to each other in contracts. Don't put things in the fine print. New ways of lying to each other nowadays is, you know, you put things in the fine print that are so technical that unless you went to law school for 12 years, you will not understand what the fine print says. And you scam people out of what they deserve by doing that. You know, you add fees in there, you add put a service charge in there, or this or that or the other. And a lot of times those conditions aren't even Islamic. And people will do that to each other even within the Muslims. So Allah says, don't eat each other's monies using cheating. Don't do that. In other words, this is now Allah talking about business ethics. Basically, it's how to run a business and how to not scam people when you do business. Do the right thing when you do business. And by the way, the ones of you in, sitting in the audience that are employees, you're not, you're not running your own business. Maybe some of you are running a gas station or you've got a company, you provide a service or you're running a medical clinic or whatever. But some of you are employees, right? You work for a company and you have a salary. You're also, in a sense, in a business. You're selling your skills and your hours for a service. So you're also, you know, you're providing something of yourself and you're taking something in return. That's also a kind of business. This is why even employees, the Prophet described them as 
right? You describe him as someone who sells himself. Literally, he sells some hours of his life to his company, his employer, and he gets a paycheck in return. So Allah says in this ayah, don't cheat people. Essentially, don't cheat people in business. Don't eat their money using falsehood. Now, just to give you a quick example of that before we talk about the hikmah, some of the hikmah of wisdom, of how it's connected to the ayat of fasting. You know, you have people that are do contracts. This is the easiest example, you know, uh, car mechanics, you know, construction workers, contractors, builders, people you, you know, or you know, service providers, like people are going to replace your carpet or they're going to, you know, paint your house and things like that, right? Now these kinds of things, they're contracts, you pay the person up front, you have an agreement, this is the work you'll do, there's a deadline, do it in 30 days, you have two weeks, whatever it is, right? And then the guy shows up late, he doesn't do his work, and he's taking extra time, then he says, oh no, the, the prices have changed, so the material's gonna be more expensive now, <laughs> right? In the middle of the contract, they'll say, oh, times are tough, gas prices have gone up, you know, we need to, I need to charge more money. And so first they lock you in, now you're stuck, because your half is half built, your house is half built, your car, the transmission is open, you gotta get to work. And then he says, you know what, prices have changed, the part is discontinued, I gotta order it from the special warehouse, and they'll tell you whatever, you know. Now you're stuck and you have to pay them more. This is the ulu of la ta'ulu amwalakum baynakum bil That's exactly what that is, you know. And you know when people do that, when people have a kind of expertise, when people have a kind of expertise, like for example, I don't know anything about cars. I don't know anything about cars. If you, if I open the hood and look underneath, it's might as well just ask me to do surgery because I don't know what's going on down there. So when I take my car to the mechanic and he says, "Yeah, you need a new timing belt," I don't even know what a timing belt is. I say, "Okay, fine, put a new timing." And he goes, "Oh, by the way, your transmission is gone. You need a new transmission." Oh, and by the way, this, that, or the other. So you go to the guy to get an oil change, and you end up paying four thousand dollars for your two thousand dollar car. But you have, and it's all because he knows things that you don't know. So if he tells you things, you have no way of checking, right? You have no way of checking. So people take advantage of that. By the way, it's not just car mechanics. Let me not pick on those. Sorry, don't those of you that are car mechanics and mess with you. But, you know, this could be with real estate agents. This could be with physicians. Oh, I need to prescribe you this, this and this and this and this and this. And for each prescription, he's getting like a cut from the pharmaceutical company. It's for him, the, 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 the patient, for, the, for certain doctors, the patient is no different from the guy who walked into the mechanic shop. It's the way to make money. That's all it is. So this, this ayah is very heavy about financial like regularity. This is, this is Allah Azza wa putting us in check. Watch out when you do business. Don't eat each, eat each other's money when you do business. The question is, what's the connection with, with, with the ayat of fasting? Allah Azza wa Jal told us immediately when He revealed fasting, He said, "Kutiba alaykum al-siyam kama kutiba ala al-nadira min qablikum." Well, listen to this part carefully. He said He gave us fasting just like He gave it to those who came before us. This surah, Baqarah, first half of it is all about those who came before us. Now, who came before us? Who, who am I talking about in Surah Baqarah? That Allah talks about in detail. But Israel, but Israel are the ones that came before us, and they did have fasting. They did have fasting, and as a matter of fact, the Prophet ﷺ, before Ramadan was revealed, he used to fast on the same days as the Jews fasted. He used to fast on the same exact days. So Allah is reminding us of the fasting of the Jews. Now if you study the first half of Baqarah, the Jews have one problem. One problem. No taqwa. See, they had no taqwa. And Allah says, I'm giving you fasting so you can have what? Taqwa. So you can have taqwa. And when Allah Azza wa talked about the Jews in the first half of the Surah of Bani Israel, what are the practices that He highlighted? They're cheating each other in business, they're lying to each other, they're, they're changing the word of Allah, they're manipulating each other, they're even ready to kill one another. Yeah, all this corruption happened, and the reason Allah highlights over and over again is they didn't have taqwa. Their, their hearts had become hard. So Allah says, I gave you fasting so you can have taqwa. And now when we think of fasting, we think of our relationship with Allah Azza wa right? 30 days of training in Ramadan so we can have a good relationship with Allah. And Allah says actually, the test whether you actually learned taqwa or not is how did your business change? Now that Ramadan is over, you're not coming to the masjid as often, you're not praying that many hours anymore, you're not fasting every day anymore, you're not doing as much dhikr, reciting as much Quran, everything has changed. You went back to business as usual, but actually it's not business as usual anymore. Now it's business based on taqwa. So now that this is actually the result of Ramadan. After Ramadan, our, our dealings with people should change. Our business practices should change. 
Those of you that are employees and walk in 45 minutes late into your office because your boss is nice. You show up at 9 o'clock now. You don't show up at 9.45 anymore because you know this is an amana. Those of you that are teachers and don't do your job preparing your lessons. You don't do your job preparing your lessons and you just walk in, ah, it's an Islamic school, who cares? It's all right. You know, nobody comes and checks anyway. The principal is busy doing other administrative things. I can just walk in and teach whatever. It's no big deal. Well, you, people are paying tuition, so they're eating their money falsely. You're eating their money falsely. You know, government jobs. You see the biggest example of this. You know, you, once you get tenure in government jobs, people are on vacation literally. <laughs> they don't do anything. So you ask them, where's the paperwork at? It's being done. It's being taken care of, like the Pakistani version, inshallah, right? <laughs> you know. Consider it done. That means it's nowhere to be found. Don't worry about it. And they're not worried about that because they know their bosses are going to come down. He's also a government employee. They're union protected and all of that. So they can just sit back and relax. You know? These ayat, we don't realize the impact of them. You know, in, in this kind of, I went to business school, right? And they tell you that the average corporate employee, the average corporate employee wastes 70% of his time while on the clock while on the clock. Either he's checking his email, she's checking her email, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Islamic lectures, you name it. Extra long lunch break, you name it. Every, anything but work. <laughs> anything but work, right? And they're, they're, very, they're, not, they're only productive like two or three hours a day, like seriously productive. But most of the time they're just killing time. Right? And then that's in, the, in corporate America where they're serious about the bottom line. Then you have government positions where people aren't serious at all and you know when we talk about the budget crisis and you have people that are being, you know, the, the, how much money is being overspent and the government's not being, being frugal enough in its spending and all of this stuff. All of it comes from people not taking their jobs seriously. That's the root problem. <coughs> the biggest expense in any organization is the human resource. And when those people don't do their job honestly, then it takes more expense to get a little bit done. And so it's Everybody's being robbed because of that one person's corruption. And you know what? The last thing I'll share on this before I move on is you know what people do when they everybody around them is corrupt. Everybody around them doesn't take their job seriously. They're all relaxed. They're all just chilling in the, at the workplace and you know doing doing whatever shady practices in their business. They say, brother, everybody's doing it. You want me to survive in my business or not? I gotta survive. I gotta do whatever you know. When in Rome, do as the Texan does. You know. <laughs> You gotta get by. This is the exact attitude that Allah Azzawajal came to destroy. Your relationship is not, your survival and your risk does not come from you following what everybody else is doing. Your risk comes from Allah Azzawajal. That, that idea that I will, my business will fail if I obey Allah already means that you don't understand where this comes from. You're not sure that it comes from Allah. You think it comes from your business. It doesn't come from your business. So, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِنِ what an amazing phrasing. Adla yudri idla in Arabic from Dalwood. Dalwood means a bucket. Dalwood Arabic means a bucket. You know, when you lower, when you, sometimes to trap an animal, you know what they would do? They tie a rope to a bucket, put a little fish or put some food in that, inside the bucket, and put the bucket towards the animal. And the animal goes to the bucket and they pull it towards themselves little by little. Until they get the animal in the trap. Right? He says, don't lower the bucket to rulers, meaning don't give bribes to rulers. Don't pay off the regulator, the inspector, you know. So that a group can eat the people's money using falsehood, using corruption, using sin. In other words, one side is business ethics, and the other side is don't pay off government officials. Don't give money to government officials. Don't have special interest groups and buy the senator or this or the other, you know, give them a little few extra gifts and send them some packages and then so that when they become, when they get into office, they award you the contract. Does that happen in our society today? SubhanAllah. You know, to this day, this is the, uh, uh, how many uh, senators and congressmen get caught taking extra money on the side from companies that they award contracts to in their, in their communities? And they milk money on the sides. This is of course, it happens in the news here once in a while. In the Muslim world, we're awesome at it. We're, we're, we're. These guys should get our autograph. We're, we're really good at it. That would be behind the program. From the bottom to the top, in our society, in our in Muslim governments, the top of the government, all the way to the bottom, man, they're amazing at eating people's money. They're incredible. You can't so much as, you know, people, I, I know stories of people, they go to Hajj. 
They go to Hajj, and they're going from their country to go to Hajj. They go to Allah's house, man. And he's going, he goes to the air, airport and he get, get, sends his passport in through the window. And the guy gives the passport back, he goes inside to him. You gotta put some money in, then close the passport, then pass it over. Then I'll let you go to Hajj. <laughs> You're not speaking my language. You understand? And this is common now, this is normal. Cop pulls you over in Pakistan, what do you do? Flip up a little, that's all they go, you go, that's it. I'm the answer, that's it. <laughs> Right? All of this is talked about in Quran. And all of this is a result of Ramadan. If you really learn your lesson in Ramadan, if Ramadan was really effective on your heart, then your practices around you will change. You will not endorse corruption anymore. Not in business, not in government. But So that a group can a group of people can eat the monies of the people. People are being swindled because of this. Because of the merger between corrupt business and corrupt government. When those two things work hand in hand, the people are destroyed. The people are the victim. You know? So you'll have policies that are developed. You know, an interesting story was about milk recently in the news. Not, not to maybe a year, year, about two years ago. There were some reporters from Fox who did a piece on the kinds of hormones that are being injected into milk and how dangerous and harmful they are, the effects they're having on children's growth and their intellectual ability, their the brain capacity, all this kind of stuff. So the, the, the milk industry, the dairy produce industry, basically threatened to sue Fox. So they killed the story. And they didn't, they didn't hear the story. And then the reporters insisted, the, the reporters got fired. So they just put their report on YouTube. Instead of putting it on Fox, they just put it up on YouTube. And they put the entire story on how they couldn't go forward. And they had even done a piece on how these regulations, the reason, you know, of course the Food and Drug Administration has to approve these hormones before they're injected into the milk, but how these industries actually pay off officials in the Food and Drug Administration to get this stuff. They were exposing all of this stuff, right? So yeah, that can't go forward, so it's just, these people are fired and they're blacklisted and all of that stuff, so I don't know. Who's being harmed by all of this? You and me that go to the grocery store and feed, feed our children that milk. We're the victims of that, right? So, And you know what you're doing. You know exactly what you're up to. So this is one area that should really be impacted by our practices of, in our, in our practice of deen. We should be completely different from Bani Israel. If we know one thing about Bani Israel, they have financial irregularities. And Allah says, you're the new nation. You shouldn't have that. Otherwise, you're just like them. What's the point of you becoming a new Ummah? Now the next issue comes up. Yes, Some people ask you about the changing phases of the moon. Allah tells them, tell them that these are different times for people to keep their calendar. Meaning that you know, people ask, what is the wisdom behind the moon phases change? Sometimes the half moon, sometimes the full moon. What's the point of the lunar calendar? Allah says these are means by which people can keep their time, the calendar. And especially the most important part of the calendar, he says, why the hajj? Well, Hajj. Already one important event in the calendar was just talked about, which was that? Ramadan. What other major event in the calendar is left? Well, our Eid is two Eids, right? One tied to Ramadan, the other tied to? Hajj. So the next, next one is mentioned? Well, Hajj. But I want to share with you why this Hajj even came up. In these ayah, what's the connection between everything that was being talked about? It seems like three different subjects. First Ramadan, then business practices, then Hajj all of a sudden. Hajj all of a sudden. Okay, you see, Hajj is mentioned because the entire second half of this surah of Baqarah, the central point of it is to appoint us as a new ummah. We are a new nation. We're not like Bani Israel anymore. Our qibla was changed in the beginning of this half. We used to pray the same qibla as Bani Israel. Our qibla was now changed. When we pray to Mursa, Mashal al Haram. We used to fast on the same days as the Jews. Now what's happened? We have to fast in. Ramadan. Even our business dealings should look nothing like their business dealings. Now Allah says, now that I've given you your new capital, your new capital is a masjid al-haram. Because we pray in that direction, that's our new capital, the capital of this ummah. But at the time that this surah was revealed, even Badr, battle of Badr hasn't happened yet. Even Badr hasn't happened yet. So we're praying towards a masjid al-haram, but actually in Mecca, al masjid al-haram, the Kaaba is surrounded by what? Idols. Even at that time, when these ayat came down, the Kaaba was surrounded by idols. 
So every time the Muslim prays the words of Masjid al-Haram, imagine you and me, we're praying towards Kaaba and the Kaaba is surrounded by idols. Would that hurt the Muslim? And the wish of the die wish of a Muslim would be, man, I could just if I could just go there and what? Get rid of all that filth, that shirk around it. So Tawheed can really be established. So Allah here says one Hajj. Now to, to do Hajj, where do you have to go? You have to go there, don't you? But is, is it the case that the, mush, the mushrikun of Mecca, the idol worshippers of Mecca, they're just going to say, Oh, Muslims from Medina are here. Come on, welcome. Please make your Hajj. Are they going to do that? No. They see you, they're going to kill you. Actually, that's the reason you moved to Medina. Because they're ready to kill you. So now, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, I've given you Ramadan. You're a different nation now, but remember your calendar involves Hajj. And Hajj is only to be made in the, in, in the city of Mecca. But to make Hajj, you first have to defeat the Meccans. You first have to defeat them. That means the moment Hajj is mentioned, you should be ready to fight. When we think of Hajj, we don't think of fighting. When the Sahaba thought of Hajj, the first thing came in their head is, man, we gotta fight to Quraysh, because if we're gonna make Hajj, we have to do it. Which is why you find this. Watch what happens. In the very, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit so you connect these things together. In the very next ayah is going to be Fight those who've been fighting you. It's totally logically connected. Everything's tied together. And incidentally, I've talked about this in the Dabs on fasting. Fasting in the month of Ramadan, the word, the, the word Saum in Arabic, Saba Yasum Saum, or those speakers say Rosa right? Saum in Arabic was actually used when you make the horse fast. And they used to make their horse fast because they needed him to stay tough in the battlefield. Because the, the camel can survive. But the horse gets thirsty, it'll die. So they trained the horse to last longer by making the horse fast. So whenever they thought of the word song, they thought of getting ready for war. That's what they thought of back in the day. So when Allah revealed fasting, the, the thing going on in the mind of the Ibn the Sahaba is like, you mean so? You mean like the one we do for our horses? What battle is coming? And then Allah says, by the way, you have to go make Hajj. Oh, that battle. Now the last bit I want to share with you guys, inshallah ta'ala, finishing off with this ayah. He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, about some sahaba. This is a really beautiful story. You see the companions, there are two kinds of course, Muhajirun and Ansar. The Ansar had been Christians and Jews for a long time. But even they actually, a lot of them, the mushrik among them, they had a lot of respect for Al Kaaba. They had a lot of respect for Al Kaaba. So the Kaaba enjoyed respect from all of the Arabs all over Arabia. Now, our respect for the Kaaba, they had certain traditions. Of course, the Meccans will obviously have a lot of traditions because they live right next to the Kaaba. But even the Medina people, the people living in Medina before Islam, even they had some traditions associated with Hajj. Hajj used to happen before Islam too. It was the deviated kind of Hajj, but it didn't used to happen. Now what did they used to do? They used to go for Hajj, and imagine they left their home for Hajj, the, back in the day, the Jahili time Hajj, the time, era of ignorance Hajj, and they forgot their money, they forgot their wallet, their cell phone, their keychain, they forgot something at home. You ever happen to you, you leave your house and say, oh, I forgot something, you gotta go back in the house, right? But they would say, if I have left for Hajj, and then I forgot my money, I forgot to pick up that bag, I forgot to get that. Oh, that's really bad luck to go back home. It's not good, because I just left for a sacred journey. I left for the sake of Hajj. So going back home is going to bring a curse on me. So to save myself from the curse, I should go home from the window. Or go home from the back door. I shouldn't go from the front door anymore, because that's bad luck. So they used to have that kind of a superstition that the, that the people used to follow. The ayat of Hajj came, and the Muslims, the new Muslims, they don't know much about Islam yet. They're new, just like you know, somebody takes shahada, you don't assume that they know everything about Islam already. So some of their old practices, they didn't know that they were bad. So you started noticing people are, you know, worried about once they leave their house, they might have to come back from the back door because it's bad luck. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, وَلَيْسَ الْبِرْهُ بِأَنْ تَأْتُ الْبِيُوتَ مِنْ غُبُورِهَا There's no good coming out of your home from the back door. Don't worry about that. That's, that's not a good thing you're doing. These are, these are superstitions of the time of ignorance. This is nothing good now. But the amazing thing about that is, of course, you guys know already, we don't have that superstition anymore. 
people go for, for Hajj from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Somalia, from all over the world, people go to Hajj. They don't have that problem anymore that when they leave for Hajj and they say, oh, I forgot my cell phone, oh my God, I live on the second floor, I need a ladder now to get back up, you know. They don't have that problem anymore. That problem is solved in this ayah. But it has another solution too. You see, in, in, in Shir al in the previous old Arabic poetry, they used to have a figure of speech. Ata shay'a min babi. The shair says, Ataytu ma'ishati min babiha. I have approached my life from the front door. Let me explain to you what that means and how it's tied to this ayah briefly. You see, when you say, I approach my life from the front door, the, the poet is saying, whenever I do something, man, I do it the legit way. I do it the legitimate way. I follow the law to the T. I do, when I do things, I do them the right way. I don't mess around. I don't try to find a shortcut, or try to find a loophole, or break the rules. Whenever I do things, I do them by the book. You know how in English we say, by hook or by crook? Right? And then there's the other side is by the book. <laughs> I do things by the book. I don't mess around when I do things. I do things properly. By Allah saying, buyuta He's also giving general advice. Not just from now on come home from the door. Everything you do from now on, you should do it properly. Don't just follow anything that you, I heard I should do this and you do it. No, no, no. Now you have the messenger with you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you want to know if you should do something or not do something, ask him first. He'll tell you if it's legitimate or not. Leave your old practices behind. Now you have the legitimate way of doing things. So in this ayah, we're told something else to save ourselves from that the previous nations suffered from. Qila wa qal. Somebody said something, you heard it, and you say, ah, oh, yeah, 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 that's how it is. Like a lot of you, your knowledge of Islam is just what you heard when you were a kid from somewhere. I heard somewhere that the angels, you could fit like 20 of them on the tip of a needle. I heard it from somewhere. Where did you hear it from? I don't know, when I was a little, I heard it. But it must be authentic, because I heard it. Okay? That's, that, a lot of people's Islam is just that, I heard somewhere. I heard somewhere it's not that bad to do this or that or the other. I heard it's not haram. Yes, you heard it, but it was wasuza from shaitan. You definitely heard it. <laughs> that doesn't legitimize anything. Allah says here in this ayah we're being told, you can't follow any of your superstitions. You have to check everything in it. You have to check whether this is legitimate in our deen or not. Especially I warn you know, uh, uh, Muslims that have lived in societies that have traditionally been Mushrik societies or other kinds of societies, and there's mixed happening. Like for example, a more contemporary example for example, is like Muslims living in Guyana. Like Muslims in Guyana after the Second World War, there's a, a Hindu migrant community, a Christian community, a Muslim community, and they mix with each other a lot. So a lot of the Muslim practices are actually mixed with their Hindu practices. You can't even draw the line clearly anymore. Look, look at the Muslims in India, Pakistan for instance. A lot of our practices in our marriages, in our self-ceremonies, you know what they look like, right? Hindu ceremonies. We don't even know where draw our line and the new line begins. Look at it in the, in the some secularized parts of the Arab world. If you go attend a wedding, you might think it's a wedding happening in like Texas. Like I said, even the way the bride and the groom are dressed, the way the ceremony is, the way they have decorated everything, it's completely Christianized. But it's a nikah. It's weird. Like it's like you look at it and you go, what is, is that a Muslim wedding or what's going on here? So you can't draw the line anymore. It become very blurry. You know. This is, the, this is what the Sahaba are being told, you need to draw a line, Islam is unique. You have to check everything by the legitimate practices. And this, my friends, will get you in a lot of trouble with your family. When you try to say, we're going to do things by our deen, and not by our, if our tradition conflicts, sometimes our tradition doesn't conflict with the religion, it's fine. But if our tradition conflicts with our deen, we'll take our deen and we'll leave the tradition. You will make a lot of enemies out of your uncles and your cousins and your friends and their neighbors. And people will not like what you, the stand you take. It's not going to be easy for you. But this is a stand, this ummah, this ummah stood up to, to stand by this religion and have its allegiances to that above everything else. That's why we became Muslim. That's why we're Muslims. Because to us, the first priority is قَالَ اللَّهُ وَقَالَ رَسُولُ Then everything else is secondary. And if anything else gets in the way, we get rid of it. It doesn't mean anything to us. Actually, I shared this story this morning with my students. I'll share it with you guys too. One of my favorite stories. Of just, you know, sometimes family ties get in the way of our love of deen. So should we go with the family or should we go with the deen? You know, there's a conflict sometimes. This is one of my favorite stories of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Allah Allah Allah. One time Aisha his daughter got into a disagreement with the Rasul 
they had a little bit of an argument. So Rasulullah says, listen, why don't we just get somebody to arbitrate? Let's get a counselor. Let's get a marriage counselor to listen to both sides and resolve the issue. By the way, those of you that are having marriage trouble and somebody said, why don't you talk to a counselor? They said, no, not me. I don't need, I don't need a counselor. What are you talking about? I'm, I have respect for myself. The Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa says, let's go get a counselor. <laughs> Who are you? It's insulting. Really? Because it's a sunnah. <laughs> so seek advice, there's no, no, no harm in it. So he says, so who should be a point? So he, he said, why don't we get Zubayr? She says, no, Zubayr loves you too much. How <laughs> sign you do. <laughs> so Aisha, he says, okay, why don't you pick? Why don't you pick the counselor? And she says, okay, my dad. Abu Bakr Siddiq, obviously those of you that are, that are fathers of daughters, the father's heart melts for his daughter. And in, a, in, a, in this kind of arbitration, obviously he's going to side with his daughter. So they invite Abu Bakr Siddiq, and he sits down. And Rasulullah asks Aisha, so you want to go first or should I go first? You know, why don't you start? He tells Aisha, why don't you start? Aisha says, no, 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 you start, because I want to make sure you say it correctly. <laughs> Husband and wife can talk that way, right? Abu Bakr Siddiq hears that and he jumps on Aisha. He's about to kill her. Rasulullah had to get in the way. <laughs> like, stop, stop, stop. That's not why he calls you here. Go, go, go. We don't need your help. <laughs> We're okay. We're fine. When it came to, you talk to the messenger that way? You talk, forget you, my daughter. I'm going to kill you. Abu Bakr Siddiq understood that very clearly. His son becomes Muslim after Badr. But in Badr, they were on opposite sides. Right? In Badr, so Abdurrahman tells, when he became Muslim, he goes, You know, Dad, in Badr, I saw you a couple of times. But every time I saw you, I ran away because I don't want to fight you. My dad. He goes, That's funny, son, because I was looking for you. Because <laughs> he wants to make sure he understands his love of Allah will not, his love of family will not get in the way of his love of Allah. That's the, that's the religion we've accepted. That's the religion we've accepted. So the lines need to be drawn very clearly for us, right? So they ask you about the changing phases of the moon. Then he said, "What is it? It will be a tattoo of the moon. It's no good you coming home from the back door. Walakin al birra man ittaqa. However, goodness is attained by whoever attains taqwa. The heart of the matter is taqwa. If you learn nothing from Surah Al-Baqarah, just learn you better have taqwa." If you learn nothing else from Surah Al-Baqarah, just learn you better be cautious of Allah. Be careful of Allah. Be mindful of how you speak, how you act, how you deal. Recognizing that you and I are in the presence of Allah Azza Come home from the front doors. Do things in a legitimate way. And continue to be cautious of Allah so you, you can become people of success that all of you may succeed. Allahumma ja'ala min al-muflihin. Allah make us of the success. And finally, the ayah will conclude with وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ Go and fight the people that have been fighting you. Go fight the Quraysh. Now it makes sense, because the Muslims aren't just going to go fight because they've been fighting us. That's not the reason. He doesn't say وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لِأَنَّهُمْ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ No, not لِأَنَّهُمْ It's not sababiyya. It's not sabab here. Sabab's already been given. Hajj. Go fight them because I already told you to go make Hajj. Go. And they've been fighting you anyway. In other words, our motivation for fighting the Quraysh was not that they fought us. That's just the secondary thing. The primary thing was the house of Allah needs to be free. The house of Allah is being held hostage. Go rescue that. So, Don't cross lines. Don't cross any limits. I know you hate them. I know you hate that they stand for shirk. I know that they've tortured your people. I know they've done a lot of crimes. But don't cross the lines. And this is another important thing. You know, subhanAllah, there's a lot of rapid change happening in the Muslim world today. Very, very quickly things are changing. And may Allah help the Muslims in Syria and all the places, right? But the, change, the, the situation of the Muslims is changing very rapidly. And when it changes, the people that were fighting you are now overcome. You overcame them. But once you overcome them, you can't just do to them what they were doing to you. Because they don't have any fear. You should have the fear of Allah. You can't just do whatever you want. You can't just go beating them in the streets and killing them. You can't do that. 
Don't cross the lines. And I tell you, Muslims have a right to get angry. And we should get really angry at someone who attacked the Messenger of Allah So you can imagine when the Muslims go against the Kuffar and Badr, those enemies that have been caught even, and the enemy, you, you can't possibly imagine hating somebody more. Because these are people who don't just hate you, they insult, they tried to kill the Messenger of Allah. They made fun of the Messenger of Allah That would drive a Muslim nuts. And yet, yet when they are caught, they are served better food than the Sahaba themselves, the POWs of Badr. They were served better food, because they were afraid, لا تعتدوا, don't cross the line. Even with the POWs, we better act nicely. You know? It's an amazing thing. It's a really amazing thing. Our ethics of war, when we engage with the enemy in Quraysh, in, in, in Badr. These ayat are before the, the, the battle of Badr. The Muslims are being prepared. The Muslims, are, their mind is being set. Look, you're a nation now, and as a nation, you have to stand for yourself, and you have to rescue your capital. And the capital is not Medina. The capital is Mecca. Because that's the direction you're praying in. So I, I'll never let you forget that's your capital. Every few hours you have to stand and pray in that direction. So you never forget that's the capital that has to be rescued. And go make Hajj there too. This is, the, this is how all of these ayat are tied together, subhanAllah. So with that, we're at ayah number 190. I'll conclude. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.